The CBS Television Network presents Lamp Unto My Feet. Here to introduce today's program is Dr. George Crothers. Today we bring you for the second time a special program commemorating one of the early struggles of the Christian era for freedom of conscience and worship. The golden book referred to in the title of our presentation was written 1,500 years ago. It was written in a language for which the alphabet had been devised only a few decades earlier. Although little known except to Armenians, it's a religious and literary classic. It's a history, a history of, the great, of a great sacrifice by the Armenian people in defense of Christianity. Today, 15 centuries later, the anniversary of that struggle is still commemorated wherever the Armenian church exists in the world, including the United States. The climactic battle of that struggle was fought in the year 451 at Avarej in Asia Minor. 60,000 Armenian Christians fought 300,000 Persians. In today's program, the narrator represents the ancient Armenian author Elisha, who recorded the history of that war, and our text is drawn largely from his own words. I am called Elisha. And my book is called sometimes by my name. I am also called Eliseus. When I lived, I was a Vardabet, a doctor of the church and a teacher. I was born 415 years after the birth of Jesus Christ, whom my people followed and for love of whom they suffered and died and triumphed. My country was Armenia, and it endures, but not unchanged. My language was the classical tongue of my people, and it suffered the fate of Virgil's Latin and Homer's Greek. But the story I tell is not my own. It is the story of a hero. It is the story of Saint Vardan the Brave. It has been said by someone in the past that death, when not comprehended, is death indeed. But death, if comprehended, is immortality. He who does not know what death is knows fear, but he who knows death knows no fear. Such a fearless man was Vardan, in whose day I lived. Remember one name, that of a place, a field, for all that goes before leads only there. The place is Avaraj, a vast plain south of Ararat. Here Vardan died, and here he gained true life. Christianity was first preached in Armenia by Christ's apostles Thaddeus and Bartholomew. Many of the early converts met martyrdom, but persecution eventually ceased in the year 301 when the Armenian ruler Turdat III, along with his family and courtiers, was baptized by Saint Gregory and Christianity became the official religion of Armenia. It was a time of flowering for the people. A man named Mesrop appeared. He had been secretary of the royal chancellery, but his name will live because it was he who invented the Armenian alphabet. Aided by the churchmen and the king, Mesrob translated the Bible. He opened schools and created a widespread craving for knowledge. It was a golden age for the Armenian people. However, in the years that followed, neighboring Persia became the master of Armenia Persians were followers of Zoroaster. They worshipped the sun and fire. In the middle of the fifth century, there came to the Persian throne Hasgir II. It is he who set in motion forces which destroyed Bardan and nearly brought an end to Armenian Christianity. The existence of these Christian heretics in my realm has become an intolerable danger to the people of my domain. I need counsel. Summon my priests. What the priests, the Magi, produced was contained in a document. It would please him very, very much. Valiant kings, the gods have given you your kingdom and victory. Now then, act with speed. Mobilize the Armenian troops and set them against the barbarians in the east. Once they are all held fast in some distant foreign land, you will obtain the object of your wishes. 
a proclamation was sent through the lands of the Armenians. Not suspecting that Asgerd was plotting their destruction, the men hastened from their provinces and joined resolutely to perform their military duties. Asgerd, believing that he could win, indeed beginning to think of himself as immortal, sent joyful tidings to the fire temples of Zoroaster. He increased the number of burnt offerings of white bulls and long-tailed goats. He honored the fire priests with crowns and distinctions and decreed that the Christian properties be plundered. But the people's faith persisted. One day, Hasgerd engaged in discussion with an Armenian youth of princely descent, Garrigan by name. Valiant king, but, but where did you learn of the suffering and death of our Lord? The books of your heresy were read before me. You should have had the reading continue. Then you would have heard of his resurrection, of his appearance before many, of his ascension into heaven, of his sitting at the right hand of his father, and, and of his promise of a second coming. The second coming that would account for the, for the glorious re resurrection of all men. Oh, that is a deception. But if you accept this truth, if you accept this truth as teachings, then you cannot deny his second coming. The king burned like the fire in the glowing furnace of Babylon. Then he poured his entire wrath and indignation over the youth. Having his feet and hands bound, he subjected him to tortures for two years. And after having deprived him of his dominion, sentenced him to death. Oh, if you would only accept the doctrine of the Magi into your souls. Or that you would exchange the heresy of your minds for the true and excellent laws of our gods. You would then stand as equals to my own noblemen. Nay, I would exalt you higher still. In the eleventh year of his reign, Hasgerd despaired of winning the Armenians with soft words and promises. Now there were only threats. All peoples and tongues must give up their false beliefs. Worship the sun, bring offerings to him and call him God. They shall feed the holy fire and fulfill all other ordinances of the Magi. Again the Christians refused. And this time, worn down by long years of rage and disappointment, Hasgerd ordered the Armenian armies isolated in a valley with the roads from east to west securely blocked. Here they were tormented and tortured and ordered to deny God. It was Vardan who petitioned the king. Heaven and earth bear witness that we have never lingered in our service to the kingdom, nor have we mixed cowardice with bravery and valor. We are being subjected to merciless tortures unjustly. I shall not set your people free until you fulfill my commands according to my will. In the face of continued defiance, Asgerd inaugurated new persecutions. He made heavier the burden of taxes, even extending them to the churches and monks, and his physical tortures increased to the inclusion of atrocities too outrageous to record. And always his priests drafted papers and arguments in favor of the worship of the sun. In reply to one of these, the princes of Armenia met in conference at the city of Ardashad and moved to defy the royal command. The statement which they drafted contains passages which live in the heart of every Armenian. In part, this is what the princes wrote. To the Grand Vizier from the bishops and princes of Armenia, who are of the same mind, many greetings to you in a peace-loving spirit. In response to your proclamation, which commands that the people of our land forsake the God of their father and worship instead the sunlight, we hereby solemnly state that there is only one God and none other, neither great nor small. Nothing that has had a beginning as God for God is eternal, not bounded by space, for he himself is space, nor bounded by any time, for all time has from him its existence. He is older than the heavens. Not only can man not perceive him, nor can he be touched by the hand of man, but he cannot be conceived by the mind of man, nor by the angels. When you learn that God made the world out of nothing, you will also understand that creatures came into existence by his word, and he who created the world himself appeared and was born without any corporeal agency, as had been announced by the prophets. This is Jesus Christ, who by himself redeemed the whole world. He willingly devoted himself to death, 
He died, was buried, rose again on the third day. He ascended to heaven and seated himself on the throne of his father. From this belief, no one can move us. Neither angels nor men. Neither sword nor fire. All our goods and possessions are in your hands. Our bodies are before you. Dispose of them as you will. The sword is yours. The neck ours. Do not therefore interrogate us further concerning all this. Because our bond of faith is not with men to be deceived like children, but with God, to whom we are indissolubly bound and from whom nothing can detach or separate us, neither now, nor later, nor forever, nor forever and ever. The entire multitude, from the highest to the lowest, assented to this declaration of faith. They bound themselves by an inviolable vow to remain true to their confession in life and death. Hasgerd was enraged. He summoned Vardan and the Armenian leaders to his chambers. So you have come. Without the ceremonies usually accorded a visitor to your court, no officer was sent to greet us, no one inquired about the health or well-being of our people. I have sworn by the great sun god which illuminates the whole universe by its beams, and gives light to all creatures by its warmth. That if on the morrow at the rise of its magnificence you do not kneel before it with me and acknowledge it as God, I will not spare you, but will bring upon you all manners of persecutions and tortures until even against your will you shall carry out my commands. Every knee shall bend. We beseech you lend ear to our few words and listen patiently. God gave the land of the Armenians to your fathers as a heritage. From that time until the present, we have continued the same duties. Indeed, we have done much more for you than for your predecessors. More? How have you done more? You taxed the Holy Church, which from the, from the beginning has been free in Christ, according to the rule of your own forefathers. They were permissive. I have done what was necessary. We never opposed you because of our affection for your kingdom. Why then? Why are we subjected to these indignities? Tell us how we have been guilty. You have opposed my will as king. Has our religion made even our taxes seem fruitless to you? I look upon the tributes of your land as detrimental to the royal treasury. I what? consider your valor and gallantry useless. Why? Because in your ignorance, you have wandered from our true religion. You despise our gods. You pollute the burning flame. You defile the water. You corrupt the very earth by burying your dead in it. The correct manner according to our beliefs. According to your beliefs? Your beliefs are making us to suffer the foul soil. I fear the gods may take vengeance upon us by your defilement. We ask only for your tolerance. Nothing more. We have said that we are ready to meet all, all torments, even death. Would it not be better for your people and for mine if we could live together without interference. Only upon my conditions. No. Never. Then I will load you with chains and cast you to the remotest parts of Sakistan. Many of you there will perish because of the heat. Those who will survive I will cast into prison. I will send an army with elephants. Your wives and children shall be banished. Your churches and abbeys demolished. And should anyone oppose me, he will be trampled by wild beasts. One of the king's privy counselors sought to bring forth a compromise. He urged the Christians to deliver themselves from danger by stratagem. Why could they not maintain their worship of God in private and at the same time seem to be complying with the king's proclamation? For a time, it seemed that the ruse had worked. Rahazgerd raised the Armenian nobles to their former rank. He restored their lands, even increasing many an allotment. But he sent to Armenia a Persian army and 700 magi to ensure the establishment of fire worship. Their churches shall be pulled down. Their books shall be removed to the royal treasury. The sound of sound shall be silenced. And the readings of the prophet shall cease. The priest shall not teach the people in their homes, 
and the believers in Christ, men and women, who dwell in the Abbey shall be forced to return to the normal ways of life. No man shall kill any living thing without making an offering, whether it be a sheep, goat, bear, bird, or suckling pig. All these things will be done within a year. Furthermore, the wives and children shall be brought to the Magi for religious instruction. We shall abolish their laws of matrimony, for I desire that a man shall have several wives instead of just one, so that the Armenian population may be much increased. What the Armenians had accepted, in theory, became a bitter draft, in fact. When the people witnessed the submission of their leaders, they were stricken with grief and broken in spirit. They cried out to them, saying, Have you forgotten the Master's precept? He who denies me before men, him will I deny before my Heavenly Father and before the holy angels. Then on a Sunday, the Magi arrived with a strong force to break the doors of the church. The people rose, driving the priests and the soldiers out of the city. The insurrection spread until the entire nation engaged in a war of liberation, which raged throughout the entire year of 450. Even the children fought valiantly. When the people would gain command of a town, the utensils of the fire temples were replaced by Christian altars and the sign of the cross. But it was a token war, a war which could not be won. The army was small and ill-equipped. There were traitors within it. But as its head stood the man whose name was even now becoming a symbol in the hearts of his people, Vardan the Brave. What do they say in the ranks, boy? Only that you were clever to capture the supplies of Vasak the traitor. They're glad to have meat again and shoes. Is that all they say? Don't they say that their pay is in arrears? And don't they despair of ever seeing it? Not that I have heard. You are very loyal. When I go out at night, I hear the cries of hungry children. What is worse, I see the shapes of children who no longer cry. I see them lying in the streets, and the shoeless and naked men and women. This is no war as I have known war. And I have been in many wars. Many. I have heard something. What? What is it? That Valsak the traitor has tried every way he knows to learn the number of our forces. If he only knew we had but ten legions. He goes about trying to learn how many have breastplates, how many are archers, how many light infantry there are, and how many have shields. Not only that, but he would seek to learn the name of our chiefs, of the best of our warriors, and who amongst us is most ready and willing to meet his death. While he's finding answers to these questions, perhaps we shall have the opportunity of driving him onto the field. He must already know the bravest, the finest we have. It is Vardan. If you think so, boy, and I will have to make it be so, if I can. With the coming of spring, the Persian king sent a mighty army of 300,000 men and scores of war elephants. The tired, scarred, and vastly outnumbered Armenians, under mighty Vardan, confronted the invaders across the banks of the river Dolmud. Before the battle was joined, Vardan spoke to his army, for what he knew could hardly help but be the last time. Valiant soldiers, you and I have been in many battles together. There are wounds and scars on our bodies, and there have been deeds of valor for which we have been excellently rewarded. But in the past, our victories were won at the command of a mortal king. Now, how much more we should be able to achieve for our immortal king, who is the Lord of the living and the dead. With the Lord standing beside us, we have many times sent the enemy's troops home in disgrace and have extinguished on every side the absurdity of fire worship. Fear not the heathen hordes and never turn your backs to the frightful sword of mortal men. If our Lord grants us victory, we shall destroy the enemy's might 
and the cause of righteousness shall be exalted. But if the time has come for us to meet a holy death in this battle, let us accept our fate with a joyful heart. Bardan walked through the tents of his soldiers in the night. To him who was unarmed, he gave arms. To him who was not clothed, he gave garments. He read aloud from the Bible, proclaiming the valorous deeds of the Maccabees. At last he took his station on the plain and waited for the night to break. When it was light, both armies, fully arrayed, rushed against each other like clashing clouds thundering forth, with peals resounding through the hills and vales. The warriors' helmets gleamed in the sun. The flash of the swords and spears was like the glare of flames in the sky. The ears were deafened by the whirring of arrows and the clanging as they found their mark against shields. The dull-minded became frenzied and the cowards deserted the field. But the brave fought courageously and the valiant roared. Many on both sides fell wounded on the field, rolling in agony. There on the battlefield, consciousness of defeat came to both sides, because the piles of the fallen bodies were so thick that they looked like craggy masses of stone. The day drew to its close, and the night approached. Many were in death's agony. Broken spears and shattered bows were strewn about. The work of destruction continued without pause until sunset. Amid the fallen cedars, the morning light disclosed the body of Vardan the brave. Even though more Persians had died than on the side of the Armenians, the battle was lost. But my story does not end quite yet. Persian domination was restored over Armenia, not over the hearts of the people. Many people went into hiding, waiting for the time of uprising. The people quitted their homes. The bride left her couch and the bridegroom his chamber, the old man his chair and the infant his mother's breast. Youths, maidens, and all the men and women fled to inaccessible places. To them, a life like that of wild beasts seemed better than comfort in their dwellings if purchased by apostasy. Without complaint, they lived on herbs and forgot their customary diet of flesh. The songs they sang were psalms. They read the sacred scriptures. Each was to himself a church and to himself a priest. Their bodies served them for the holy altar and their souls were the offering. They waited for the day when they might bring their beliefs out into the open once again. For well, they knew that a day was coming, and it did come, but not before 32 years had passed. And when it came, the leader was Vardan's own nephew, Vahan. Vahan, through a series of brilliant guerrilla actions, was finally able to convince the Persian king of the futility of establishing fire worship in Armenia. The Treaty of Nuarsak was signed in the year 483, and Christianity again saw the light of Armenian skies. The night before his crucial battle, Vardan and his men had prayed to God. If we die, may our death be like unto those of the righteous. May the shedding of our blood be like unto that of the sainted martyrs. May God be pleased with our sacrifice and deliver not his church into the hands of the heathens. And now through his nephew, Vahan, his prayer was answered, although not without the sacrifice which he had so bravely tendered. The ice of many winters melted. Despite an endless series of misfortunes and tribulations through the centuries, the ancient and much-tested Armenian church will endure the memories of Vardan and Vahan will be cherished by posterity. <coughs> to close my book, I find these words. May we inherit the kingdom of heaven and be worthy of all that has been promised to the beloved of God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. With the triumph of the Vahan, the right of peaceful worship was temporarily secure, 
And in the centuries that followed, Armenians were forced to fight again and again in defense of religious freedom. But always, the example of Vardan inspired them to hold fast and to affirm anew their faith, so that even today, the church is the dominant element in Armenian community life. In America, freedom of religion has been established in the Bill of Rights, and it's been protected in our courts. But the history of man's repeated and continuing struggles for freedom of conscience reminds us all of the dangers we face if we ever take this liberty for granted. The CBS Television Network has presented Lamp Unto My Feet, a weekly program of religion in contemporary life. Next week, Silence, a play by Roman Brandstetter. Lamp Unto My Feet is a public affairs presentation of CBS News and was pre-recorded.